please rise and join me in singing the uh, hymn number 533, which you will find in the blue hymnal in front of you. Please be seated. On behalf of all of us at Calvary, I want to welcome you to this end of week two of our 90th year of the Calvary Lenten preaching series. And it is my great joy today to introduce my friend Phyllis Tickle, who, who needs no introduction really. But I, I want to tell you one thing about her, uh, perhaps the thing about her that charms me more than any other, and that is that she uh, is a woman of great spiritual strength. And I know that that strength comes from her faithfulness to a daily practice of prayer. I asked her just before we came in how many books on the daily office she has written, or the divine hours. And she told me eight she thinks. So it inspires me to once again try to be more faithful to my own life of prayer. And I just picked up this beautiful, uh, skinny, short book. Um, but there are others in the bookstore which you may have a look at as you leave here. We have a little bookshop set up in the, in the Great Hall. We also hope that you won't be frightened off by the snow and that you will stay around for lunch following. Now please take a moment to silence any of your noisemakers that you have in your pocketbooks or your pockets and let us join together in some centering music as we prepare our hearts and minds for what we are to hear. Good morning. 
to all of you. Or good afternoon. I'm, I'm never, every time when I stand up here to do this, I'm not sure what time of day it really is. Good midday, I guess. Is, you know, I don't know whether everybody ever said good midday, but good midday to all of you on, on this Friday. Um, on this uh, Friday that brings to, well, every Friday, of course, brings to a conclusion the week, doesn't it? We might almost say, thank God it's Friday and be terribly unoriginal. Uh, but uh, certainly this Friday, when we have had, uh, especially in the last 48 hours, such a very rich time in this building, uh, both uh, yesterday for the Linton and day before for the noon Linton, and then on Wednesday evening uh, over in the Great Hall itself where Brian McLaurin uh, came among us and shared with him, with us so much of what he is doing these days. Uh, as you know, McLaurin is um, the leader, uh, the acknowledged leader, the God-drenched leader uh, of a form of Christianity, a new form that's evolving, a movement within the faith called Emergence Christianity. And to have him here was a great gift and a great pleasure. So it has fallen to me on this Friday uh, to be the Fridayness of this kind of week, to bring it to some kind of closure, uh, if you will. And that was the intention right from the beginning that uh, he would speak. Okay. You don't like the... Oh, okay. See? I never know when this happens, whether it's God telling us something or not, but... <laughs> Yes, yes. There we go. All right. We have seven children and live in the country. I can be heard in a nave. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this I don't need, but we will. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. That's technology is wonderful until it doesn't work. So anyway, um, it is uh, the intention of the program or whatever that I should try to bring some completion. Uh, to this wonderful week and uh, to put it into some kind of perspective. And in order to do that, I have to tell you a story. Uh, you knew that before you came, most of you anyway, that uh, I'm a storyteller and it, it, so be it. I'm going to tell you one that you know, uh, one that, uh, or at least some of you do anyway, one that I think, if memory serves correctly, I have told once before in this very space. Nonetheless, it's, it, needs, it needs retelling and it needs retelling today at the end of a week like this. And the story goes like this. Once upon a time, in the dark times of history, in the dark ages gone by, there was a man who lived in the land of Paden Aran. And his name was Abram. And he was married to a, a woman named Sarai. And Sarai was sterile and could have no children. And so they lived together, unhappily, but about no children, but happy with each other, if you will. And Aram had a, a, a nephew named Lot. Uh, and because there were to be no children, in due course, he adopted Lot to be his heir apparent. But then one day, the word of the Lord came to Abram and said, Get up and leave uh, Paden Aran and go over to a land I will show you. You are to go west. You are to go west across the mountains and the plains near to the great sea. And Abram, believing God and believing the voice, took Lot and took Sarai and took all of his worldly goods, for he was a bit of a, of a desert lord and quite wealthy and going to be wealthier. And he made that trek over into what you and I would now call Palestine, or if you will, the Holy Land, whatever. And there he settled down in his complex of, of tents and began to set up housekeeping. And in due time, Lot was, as he matured, obviously being trained to, to also take over the estate because he was to be the heir. And in due time, Lot, who had never had to do too much, it's bad when young men don't have to do too much. When you inherit in diapers, it's truly bad. And that's what happened. He had been told he was going to get it from the get-go. And so he'd never learned some of the, the rigors, if you will, of being a good leader. And in time, he began to just become a bit of a fop and did not want to work all that hard. And so increasingly, he, he tried to take the best land for himself, the best grazing land for his own cattle, the best of everything, until finally Abram said to him, let us not quarrel, my nephew and my loved heir. heir. Let us not quarrel. You take the part of the land that you want. You take the best if you wish, and I will take what's left, and I will move my herds and my compound to whatever is left, and you may have yours. 
And accordingly, Lot did indeed choose the best part of that holy land to graze his cattle. But he also chose not to live in a compound of tents. He chose instead to go into the city, to become a city boy, so to speak. See, they could still hear me. What kind of story no, is this? No, that's not true. Oh, okay. Do you, can you guys hear now? All right, I am so sorry. I did not realize it had fallen off. Shedar Loemir, though, is king of Edom, and he has three fellow kings who are in league with him, so that there is a league of four kings that are part of the Edomite territory. And they begin to get hungry, and they begin to look over toward the Holy Land, and they begin to see fine fields and fat cattle, and then they also begin to see batumen, or tar. And so there comes the spring that Sedar Loyermer takes his three colleagues, and they begin to move north in order to go around the mountains and across the plain and over into what you and I would call the Holy Land. And as they go, because they can travel and conquer only during the warm season, they go just so far, and then the winter comes, and they have to retreat to Edom. The next year, they do the same thing, only this, this part of the country has been conquered, and so there's nothing to conquer. They move easily through it, and then a little farther down. And the next year, even farther, working their way down the eastern side of the Jordan River, working their way toward the Dead Sea, working their way toward the League of Five Cities and their five kings, working their way toward petroleum, toward the tar, toward the bitumen. And there comes the year in which they make it, and they conquer. Shadar Loermir conquers the five kings, and he takes the city and then and the cities, and then he says to them, I will not burn, I will not destroy, I will not take captives. If you understand that you must pay a levy to me every single spring, I will send an emissary, and I will tell you how much is to be paid as levy, and you will pay it. And Bira and Bisha and their three colleagues agree, for there was no way to defeat him. He was too strong. 
And so the Bible says, for 12 years, the five kings paid Shedar Loermir his levy. They greeted his emissary, they paid. But in the 13th year, in the 13th year, Bitter said to Bittersha, no more. We are stronger now, we can defeat him, no more. I will not pay the levy. And so the five kings agreed that they would not. And when the emissary came from Shedar Loermir, they beat him and they sent him back to Shedar Loermir, back to Edom, saying, we will not pay, come and get us if you wish. And nothing happened that year. But the next year, come the spring, roaring out of the east up to the north and down the east side of the Jordan, here came Shedar Loermir with his three colleague kings, and he was furious. And he captured the cities. He beat them down, he put them to the sword, and ultimately he began to push the leaders farther and farther toward the tar pits where they either suffocated in the bitumen or they were burned to death according to where they fell into the pits. And at that point, Bira and Birsha said, no, we surrender. In every way, we surrender. And the five cities gave up. And Shedar Loermir began with his troops to take everything that was there, to rape the women, to drive the men ahead of him up toward the north end of the Jordan, back toward Edom. Now the Bible says there was a young man in my imagination, he probably was 12, 11 or 12, too young to fight, old enough to understand what's happening. There was a young man who somehow escaped, went round the southern end of the Dead Sea, up the western side of the Jordan, almost to Jerusalem, or what we would call Jerusalem, though it wasn't there, to the oak groves of Mamre, over to where Abram was encamped, over to the compound that belonged to the warlord, whom we know as Abram. And when he got there, that young man said, my Lord Abram, my, my Lord Abram, my Lord. Let me tell you, the cities have fallen. They have fought, and they have taken your nephew Lot. And that was all Abram had to hear. They have taken your nephew Lot. And so, the Bible says, Abram had in his employ 318 young men, which means he had his own national guard of a sort. He took his 318 young men, and he went below what we would call Jerusalem now, but over the north end of the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, and he met and engaged Shedar Loermir just as he came up the eastern side of the Jordan, and there they fought. And Abram was victorious. He beat Shedar Loermir and his three colleagues. He rescued all the goods from the five cities and all the citizens from the five cities, and he sent them all, all of Shedar Loermir back to Edom. Now, in those days, it was understood, because it was a warfaring place and a warfaring culture, it was understood that when one desert lord rescued another desert lord, they would meet in what was called the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of Shabbos, to give it its Jewish name, just below where you can still see it, just below where Jerusalem is now. They would meet there on a, an appointed day, and they would decide how much the rescuer got of what had been rescued and how much the rescued got to keep in order to continue life. So the day was appointed, and it was understood that the five kings, Bitter and Bisher and their colleagues, would come in from the eastern side of the valley of Shava, from the bottom of it, and Abram would come in from the western side, there at the base of the valley, and they would meet there, and they would separate out who got what. And so on the appointed day it happened, that the five kings do indeed come into the Valley of Shabbat, the Valley of the Kings, from the left side, from the east side, and here comes Abram from the other side. And as they enter that valley, at the north end of it, just where Jerusalem would in time come to be established, there appears this magnificent presence, so magnificent that we don't even know his name. We know his title. It was the Melchizedek, prince of the, priest of the Most High God, prince of Salem, prince of peace, without progeny and without progenitor. And there he stands. And he stands so magnificently that Abram immediately falls to his knees and does obeisance before whatever this vision is. And the Melchizedek reaches out takes Abram by the shoulder, lifts him up, 
blesses him, turns to an acolyte behind him, takes wine and bread, turns back and gives the bread and wine to Abram. It is the beginning of our Eucharist. It's the first time it's celebrated there in the Valley of Shabbos, there when the Melchizedek blesses Abram. And then, when that is done, returning to the acolyte, the bread and the wine, he takes from Abram 10% of all that the booty of the war. And then he recedes back up where he came from, from the north end of the valley. And that being done, in due time, Bira and Birsha and Abram decide who's going to keep what from the rescued material. And Abram is so moved by what has happened that he keeps very little, only enough just for his 318 men, and sends the five kings back to reestablish their civilization at the base of the Dead Sea. And then Abram, with Lot having been rescued, goes back to the oak grove at Mamre, back to his compound, when within three days he will receive a visitor, a visitor who will say, I am come from God, and you are no longer Abram, you're Abraham. And your wife is no longer Sarai, she is Sarah. And a child will come to you. And out of that child, all the peoples of the world shall be blessed. And Abram fell down before this vision, and he arose up Abraham. And within a matter of months, Sarai did, Sarah did indeed conceive. Isaac was born, and the promise had begun. So it was that the Jewish people understood always, always from the get-go, that when Meshwa came, when Messiah came, he would be the Melchizedek, that the Melchizedek was indeed the first presentation of Messiah, without progeny, without progenitor, priest of the Most High God, King of Salem. And so when you go home, if you look at Psalm 110, for instance, you'll see that great, beautiful section of poetry. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The song of Jewish people waiting for Messiah, waiting for Christos, waiting for the Melchizedek to come back. And so it was told all those centuries that that's what would happen. And then in due time, at the turn of our era, 2,000 years ago, there arose in the town of Nazareth a man, a God-man, a man whom we call Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who the people suspected was indeed perhaps the Messiah. But the religion people around them, the religious folk, the leaders, were not sure at all that this was a good thing. And they did not like this young rabbi. And so he taught in their streets for two, and he came into the third year of his ministry. And he comes to Jerusalem, and he's standing just outside the temple in the outer court. And they bring to him, do these religious leaders, a young woman caught in adultery. And they say to her, to him, look, rabbi, look, she has been caught in the ultimate sin. Shall we stone her? Testing him, testing to see what he'll say. Will he go with the law as they understand it, or will, they, will he go with this thing he's preaching? And so they test him, and he refuses to answer. He simply says, let the one of you who has not sinned throw the first stone. And no stones got thrown. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders and the rabbis were not happy, for what he had done was outfox them. He'd outfox them. And so he moves into the temple, and he begins to teach the people, and he begins to talk about Abraham, and he begins to talk about the heritage, and they begin to question him, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees come back to him and say, what is this? You're not keeping the law of Abraham. You're not keeping the law as it has been given to our father Abraham. And they push him, and they push him, and he baits them a little bit, he baits them a little bit more, and he finally says, you do not understand. You are not children of Abraham. You are not sons of Abraham. You could not live as you live were you sons of Abraham. And they back up and say, what? What are you saying to us? What do you know of Abraham? And he turns in the most magnificent, for me, 
conception of the whole New Testament. When they say, you are not 50 years old, how can you know Abraham? How can you know what he would do? He turns and he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he walks away. It is his declaration. He has used the Jewish name for Yahweh, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And putting down their stones, they retreat and he walks away. And then he will be crucified. He will be resurrected. Christianity. But in the days following that resurrection, there will be the growth of Christians. Those who know that this has been real. Those who want to follow this strange man. And so we will get the beginning of the church. And within some 30 or 40 years after that, we get someone, we don't know his name, who began to write a letter of instruction to those young Christians, to those Jews who were now Christian, who were trying to put their true traditions together, who were trying to understand what had happened, and who wanted to follow this, this Jesus. And so the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, to the guidebook, to the one who was trying to explain to them what had happened, gives what for our scripture is three chapters, a long section of the book of Hebrews, chapters 5, 6, and 7, as we now show the thing in which that leader, that person, that pastor, says to these young Christians as they're beginning to shape themselves up out of Judaism, do you not understand what has been said? He is Melchizedek. Go home and read it. Three chapters of Hebrews. This is Melchizedek. This is without progeny and without progenitor. This is what we were promised in the Valley of Shabbos. And they believed, and they believed. And so in all the years since, you and I come into these places. We will come here on Good Friday to mourn the death of the Melchizedek. We will come on Easter Sunday to celebrate the coming back, the resurrection. And we will understand when we do that therein lies the completion of the most ancient of stories. And by whatever name you may call yourself, Roman Catholic, Episcopalian, Emergence Christian, Emerging, Emergent, Baptist, Lutheran, Orthodox, Roman Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, Syriac, in all the Christianities of the world, by whatever name you call yourselves, this is our story. This is the story from its beginning right up to this place and to you and me. The great English poet T.S. Eliot, who in speaking of these things, wrote some of the best loved lines in English poetry. You will probably remember them. In which he said, and when we come to the end of all our exploring, we will arrive again at where we started and we will understand that place for the first time. May it be so with us as we live into the history, the myth, the wonder, the glory of the Melchizedek this Lenten season. If you would like to greet Phyllis before you go, uh, we will be standing at the foot of the chancel steps for a few moments. So please make yourself known to her if you would like to. And may God, who is present in sunrise and nightfall, and in the crossing of the sea, guide your feet as you go. May God, who is with you when you sit and when you stand, encompass you with love and lead you by the hand. May God, who knows your path and the places where you rest, be with you in your waiting. 
be your good news for sharing and lead you in the way that is everlasting. And may the blessing of the eternally loving God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and all the days of your life. Amen.